we're back again, and we got a special guest in today, Gunan Amil. Adamil. Adamil. <laughs> How are you doing, Gunan? I'm all right. I'm all right. I'm a little bit sniffly. Oh, it's okay. You know, when you're just working hard, you're putting too much hours, and you need some rest anyway. <laughs> I do. You know, and um, also, you know, we we're going to talk a bit about Gunan's timeline, but first of all, you know, she's a journalist, has her own show on the BBC, The Upfront Show. Great show. It's been going for how long, Gunnar? It'll be 40 years next year. 40 years? 40 years. And I've been, I've been on it 15 years on and off. Wow. Um, but presenting it for 10 years. Amazing, amazing. Yeah. So what we're going to do, we're going to rewind a bit. We're going to deal with your timeline, because I know when you went to university to do journalism. Yeah. And to talk you so far to where you are now. So if you could please just explain a little bit. Okay, so I went, it's, it's funny because um, initially I wasn't going to do journalism. Um, my plan was to be a doctor like my dad. Wow. So for a lot of people who might not know, I wasn't born in Liverpool. I was born in Nigeria. So Whoa. yeah, yes, yeah. So my family, my dad moved us to Liverpool in 1980, 1983. 83. Yeah, yeah. So, but my mum was born in London. She was born in Camberwell. So she was already a British citizen. And, you know, I won't talk too much about it, just in case you're going to ask me, well, you, I know you might ask me questions. So my granddad was a journalist. Okay. So that's why he ended up in the UK back in 1955. Wow. Had me mum in 1957. So he worked for Oxford and Cambridge University writing books for um, around African history. Amazing. And African um, culture and tribes and all those types of things. And my dad worked for the United Nations, and it was the United Nations that encouraged him and a few of his colleagues to move their families abroad. And my dad, being forward thinking, was like Liverpool. <laughs> wow. So we moved in to Liverpool in 1983. Um, so, yeah, so fast forward, I went to, you know, wasn't wanted to be like my dad because I loved how he travelled around the world. You know, his expertise was the HIV AIDS virus. Wow. So he was in Brazil, Hong Kong, um, London, Geneva. Like, he was always everywhere. Great you know, travel. and I was like, yeah. I want to be a doctor because I want to be like my dad, you know. And um, but then I realised, actually, no, that's not, that's not me. I love people. I love talking to people. Yeah. And I was like, that's, it's journalism. That's where I want to be. That's for you. That's for me. Yeah. You know. So, yeah. So, I applied um, to go to John Moore's University. And, yeah, I was lucky. I got an unconditional offer um, to go there. Um, but in between then, went to London when I was 19. Lived in London for just over a year. Best experience ever. Absolutely loved it. Because I came back, like, a different person. So, anyone who's left Liverpool or who's lived anywhere, you, you realise that... There's more out there, you know, not in a bad way. No, I totally understand. I totally understand where you mean. I mean, I th we have these discussions all the time. Yeah. And um, as far as being a black person, you know, come out of Liverpool, it, you, it's the opportunity is just, it's, you can't compare the opportunities, yeah. you know yeah. what I mean? But anyway, so explain anyway about, yeah. yeah, continue what you're saying about London. So, yeah, I think for me with London, it was, I was happy. I was a happy black African woman. Do you know what I mean? Like, there was a moment when I was in Liverpool that I faced discrimination, you know, from both black and white. You know, I think there was a, a, there was a certain type of black that the community was used to, and I wasn't that. Right, do yeah, you know I mean? yeah, I understand. So, yeah, yeah. certain things I would do, it was like, why are you acting white? Not realizing actually, I come from a Nigerian family. That's how most Nigerians yeah. <laughs> behave. Yeah, yeah. You get me? I've totally, yeah, it's, I understand. You know? Yeah. And then obviously, white people were like, oh my God, you're different. I was like, well, no, I'm not different. This is just the way. It's a good culture you come well, from. Exactly. A good background. So when I went to London now, I'm mixing with so many different people. Um, I'm not the odd one. I'm the odd one out, but in a special way because I'm a black scouser. You know, so mm. I learned so much. You know, there was I, I loved it, absolutely loved it. But I knew I weren't going to stay, um, unless I got you know I went there to be a, t a, a TV presenter. Yeah, yeah. But I enjoyed myself. I partied. <laughs> that didn't happen, and then I came back because I had the I had the back um, the comfort blanket, knowing that I had an unconditional offer for uni. So if it didn't wait, if it didn't work out in London, I had something to fall back on. Good, good. So lucky enough, I you know came back, went to uni, did journalism. Um, but 
I think it was like my second year, my dad passed away in oh, Nigeria. Right. So I had to go leave uni and then go to Nigeria. So I was in Nigeria for I think like six, eight months. Wow. Yes, I missed a big chunk of my second year. Um going to Nigeria and then when I came back, um, they wanted me to repeat my to repeat the second year and I was like, No, I just wanna graduate. You know, I don't okay. care what mark I get. Yeah. I just wanna graduate. Yeah. And they were like, all right, well, if, if that's the case, you're only going to leave with a third class degree. And I was like, it's fine. It's fine. You know, um, but in looking back now, I definitely think there was certain course marks that I could have got higher on. But there were certain two lecturers that definitely had racist undertones. Yeah. Do you yeah. know what I mean? Yeah. And, you know, I was too, I was still grieving. That I just couldn't be bothered fighting. I just wanted to finish so I could go back to Nigeria and do what I needed to do. Um, so yeah, I graduated with my third class degree in journalism, and I'd say for a while I was in, I was embarrassed. I didn't want to tell people because everyone comes out and like, oh, I got a first class, I got this, you know, and I was just like, oh God, yeah, you know, yeah. uh, it's me. Everyone, everyone assumes I'm clever. I mean, I am clever, but it was like they would have expected more from me. Okay. In terms of my mark, right? But then as time went along, I was like. My mark doesn't define me. It's my passion for the industry that defines me and what I want to, you know, what I want to do with that's, it. That's the main thing it is because, you know, you, just because you have your degree, it's what, what are you doing with your degree anyway? And just from listening to your show and being on your show, yeah, I came on, well, the first, many, I think it was last You've year been before. been on about three times. Uh, <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. One time with Patrick as well. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, with this, this, this is also another reason why it's exchanging, bringing you back on this show because, you know, so anyway, university, yeah. and he said that like you want. So you've 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 left now. Yeah, you're going along with your career. You've been to London. Yeah, you've gone to Nigeria. Yeah. So now in Nigeria, what is it like there? I mean, that's my route to Nigeria, yeah. but I definitely need to go. What was it like and spending so much time there? Six months, you were saying, isn't it? Do you want to know the truth? <laughs> oh, I'd love to hear the truth. <laughs> um. I don't want to scare anyone in the slightest because not all families are crazy. I mean, the majority of them can be. Um, so when my dad passed away, you know, my dad was quite wealthy, you know. Right. Well, he was, he was one of those dads, African dads, was like, he was all about, you've got to get what's yours. I've worked hard for mine. I'll support you to a certain extent, but you need to get what's yours. That's so right, me yeah. and my brothers, we all worked at 16 as well as going to college. You know, okay. so my first job was at McDonald's. So I was going to McDonald's, working yeah. at McDonald's and going to sixth form. So when my dad passed away, he left quite a bit of money and um, property good, and good. businesses and stuff. Um, but then I've got siblings. I've got older siblings. Yeah. And they tried to get us killed. <laughs> and I laugh now because I'm still here to tell the tale. Wow. You know, they try, and when I say they tried to get us killed, I'm not saying like we heard it through the grapevine. I'm saying we saw the people in our faces with knives and, you know, socks with stones in it. Yeah. Um, they surrounded our car. Um, like it was it was crazy. That's it, serious stuff. Yeah, tried to pull me out the car. Um, if it wasn't for the way my uncle drives, wow. like we, like I wouldn't be here. Me, and my mum would not be here. Wow. They attacked my brother's friends. Like the, it was, it was hardcore, you know. But you know, I'm, I'm into my spirituality, and I've always been into spirituality. And this notion of the universe has your back. Yeah. You know, they always say what's meant for you will, will, will not pass. That's right. Yeah. You know, so I've always felt protected, and I knew that nothing was going to happen to me, regardless of what was around me. I knew yeah. I was safe. You know, and it was mad at that time because in hindsight, actually going through what I went through has actually given me that fighting spirit to get to where I am right now. Yeah, yeah. You know. Well it's 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 more of a mission and a path and you know you've stayed on your path. That's the main thing also what you've done. Like I mean from that was you, you were young when you went to u university. Twenty yeah, 21, 22. 21, yeah, 22. Yeah. That's a long time ago, maybe <laughs> 20 years we're talking about. Yeah. So, you yeah. know, you've, you've, you've just elevated c constantly and yeah. constantly. I see it all the time on different shows sometimes. Yeah. And, you know, you do really good. You're a good talker, yeah. presenter. And what was the reason, would you say, when, when you first got onto the BBC? Yeah. What was the reason for the upfront show? 
You know what? So how I got into yeah. working on Upfront, it was through um, James Class, who sadly passed away, and Mandy Smith. So the Upfront show was originally started by those two and Barbara Phillips. Okay. Um, God, 40 years ago. And they wow. just, knew, you know, they knew that there was a need for the, the black community's voice on that show. So I was part of a scheme that James Class and Mandy Smith had put together in um, partnership with the Job Centre and Radio Merseyside. So they interviewed a few of us and seven of us got into this programme to be trained up in radio and hopefully see what will happen with us. You know, so, yeah, so I got, so I was one of the, one of the lucky seven to get on it. Um, and literally, like, I couldn't even, I mean, the way we were taught and understanding um, the community was next level. You know, I think a mistake that a lot of people make and organisations is not fully understanding the Liverpool born black community, the Liverpool A community. That's right, yeah. You know? Yeah. And understanding um, the history of the community as well. Yeah. So, for me, even though I've been in Liverpool since I was, what, th um, three? I've lived on Princess Avenue. I've lived on Grove Street. Um, as a second generation migrant, I, st I still, ha my family hasn't been through what, the toxic community has gone through, the Liverpool Lake community has gone through. Yeah, yeah. So my my thinking is completely different. Okay. Does that make yeah, sense? Yeah, yeah. Those, those so doing the show and being amongst people from the community and being trained by someone like James Class and Mandy Smith, it really opened up my eyes to what was there and what we needed to do and how we needed to approach the voices in our community. You know, and that actually built me up in terms of fully understanding how different communities were as okay. well. Okay. Uh, yeah, yeah, no yeah. different black communities outside of London, you know, yeah, uh, because we're, we're all we're so different. Yeah. Um, but the struggles is the sa are the same. That's right. You know, totally. So, doing you know, what attracted me to that apprenticeship was just wanting to be back home, wanting to fully understand how things worked, and my love of journalism is has always been about representing the voice of the voiceless. That's it. Given yeah. you know, I I look at myself as I'm not just a t I'm not just a radio presenter. I feel like I'm a vessel. You know, I'm there to yeah, support yeah. people's journey. I'm yeah. there to support people's voices. I'm not there to um, make anyone look bad or feel bad. Or I'm not a hard news journalist. That's you know, right. I don't yeah, want yeah. people crying on my show. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, I was po you know what? Definitely, I can relate to that because funny enough, when I started doing the Discovering show, I said I need to do something positive. Yeah. We can out. We can. I mean, sometimes you can. We can talk about things that are negative, but that's be positive outcomes. Exactly. Because we just are falling into that negativity. And speaking of being spiritual, like you said before, if you're negative and you're spiritual, you will bounce that back the same way. If you're positive, thank you. Manifest what thank you, you what you want. People don't get that. You don't get it. You don't no, get that's it. That's right. That. And and this is why I see all the time people say to me, "Oh yeah, meditate. I'm spiritual," but your energy is negative. Energy. That's and, right. and this is the thing, isn't it? And so many people don't realise that when you're saying you're spiritual and you are meditating, what you're putting out there is still negative. Yeah. Your abundance is blocked, you know, and... Open your chakras. You know what I'm saying? And That's people right. don't realise. Like, mm. one of the conversations I've had in the past as well is you can't manipulate the universe. You can't manipulate it. If you are genuinely not a good person... It knows. It knows. You know, yeah. and and that that's that, that's always been my thing. You know, so everything that I've gone through, I take that as a blessing. I'm always grateful. Yeah. Always grateful. I'm not only grateful for the good things, I'm grateful for the impact and the negativity that have come my way as well. So when you know, when all the stuff happened to me in Nigeria, you know, I was gutted because this is family, this is blood. But you know what? It set me up. It set me up to fully understand that Blood is not, you know, re family is not just blood. It's yeah, the community yeah. that you that you build yourself. That's I, right. You know, I've got I've got supporters in Liverpool. There's people that talk my name when I'm not in the room. That are constantly supporting me, okay. cheerleading me, and I don't even know who they are. Okay. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. But it's there though. It's there. Yeah. You know, and then you've got people who are the closest to you who you think will be cheerleading you, but they're the ones putting that dagger in. 
Yeah. So for me, that that experience really opened up my mind to to be grateful for the people that I do have around me, regardless if they're blood or not. Yeah, yeah, you know? that's right, yeah. Well, that's the community for you, isn't exactly. it? Exactly. You know, it is. Exactly. You know, so me doing journalism, I knew there was, there was that connection. There was something that I needed to do with it. It was a gift, you know, that I needed to share, but also to support and help people, you know. So it was, uh, you know, for me, journalism is my life. The media industry is yeah. my life. So through your yeah. experiences, like you're saying, what happened to you in Nigeria, negativity. Now, me personally, you mentioned that to me. You might, um, another person might look at it differently and yeah. panic and this. I don't panic. I've traveled around the world. Yeah. I've been so many different places, different. Took myself to jungles. It's seven <laughs> hour, 12 hour drives. And, you know, but, but anyway, my open mind is I still want to get there. Yeah. I've heard stories. I've heard this. I've heard that. Family you've been before have told me bad things. Some people told me good things. But I will go there myself, obviously, be cautious. Yeah. And I've, be careful who you trust, of yeah. course. <laughs> like you've just said, sometimes family can be the ones to set you up and that. But it's brought the best out of you. Oh, for, for sure. So we're going to deal with the positive side <laughs> of that, you know, because if it's take the negative and make it positive, which you've for done. Sure. That's for sure. That's the motto. For sure. Anyway. And, and it is, it's just, I think... You can't, it's it's funny, isn't it? Because people always say, oh, you're always happy. And I'm like, because I've got nothing to be sad about. You know, I'm genuinely um, a happy person, you know. And it's mad because even though, I used to always say, I want, to, you know, I want to be like that. I want to like, you know, I want to travel. And then I did, I, you know, I ended up traveling through work, yeah. you know. And like you said before, everyone has experiences, but that should never put you off. That's right. You know, yeah. and there's times when I've been asked to go to certain countries and I've gone, oh, how are they going to receive me? Are you going to be racist? Are you going to be, you know, but I've gone, let me just go. Yeah. And it's been one of the best experiences, you know, and I still go to Nigeria. I go to Lagos quite a bit for work. So for me, you know, I didn't allow that to stop me from going back home. Good. I didn't want to because then that, that would have meant day one, you know. Most oh, definitely. So for me, it was like, you have to, Sometimes you just have to face those demons head on. You know, it's it's that notion of you know, when people say you've got to you've got to break through that that, that brick barrier. wall and that's where that's where the gold is. And some people stop at the brick wall. Yeah. And even when they break in it, they get tired. You've got to keep on going in it. You've got to keep, keep on going, going. Keep going. Got to keep is. on going because that gold, once you get it, <laughs> like that literally that's where utopia is well here's a perfect example of what you're saying when i've traveled a lot of places sometimes i'm looking for people who you're going to travel with sometimes yeah. you don't want to travel by yourself sometimes sometimes it being people who came with me about your cousin about you know different people yeah. girlfriend different people so when about different people come with me some people will be like well i don't want to go there yeah i don't want to go there that be all the reasons you've just said whether yeah. it was racism or something there's always something a negative block but you know what Go where you want. If you can fly there, you can fly there. If you can get there, you can get there. Then whatever way you're going to get there, you know. And that's what I love about you, you know, James, because when I first heard your story, I was like, this guy's brave. You I know. I want to really, it from a child, like when I had a globe yeah. and a map, and I was thinking like, oh, you know, you're spinning the globe, yeah. the blue water, <laughs> then you see Hawaii, you see Africa, you see, oh, you see, see every place, but... It's just then it's manifesting. This is what I will be doing. Yeah. My father's line was a seaman. My yeah. granddad was a seaman from Nigeria. So it's all about being, that's what I mean. Some things, like you just said, your uh, father or your grandfather, a journalist. Yeah. So some things are just naturally passed on. Yeah. You know, so I come from a line of travelers. You know, that, that that's what it's about. And, and it's not just the traveling, it's what I wanted to go into the most remote areas yeah. and find the most um, indigenous tribal people. And even like when I went to Asia, I mean, we knew about Africa, of course, but when I went into Asia and I find the indigenous black peoples in Southeast Asia, like the Philippines, Thailand, Malaysia, Indonesia, and you can go on there, Cambodia, and there's all traces of our ancestors, which obviously left Africa, the first peoples, and then later on brought the seeds of civilization into these areas. Yeah. So you could look at the Buddha statues, the oldest ones, they always look like African people. You can look at ancient America, look at the Olmecs. It's all depictions of our... We've left our trace wherever this country within. We have Cheddar Man, who we've seen on the BBC. Yeah. You know, this, maybe 20 years ago, he didn't say what colour he was, but now with their supposedly great technology, he's a black man. Yeah. 
But this is showing we're the indigenous original people wherever we go in this world. So f- we should never have that attitude we can't go somewhere. And, and you, know you know what? And that's the thing, isn't it? Because so I, um, I got sent to Bangladesh. Wow. So I was working in Dhaka. And um, I, rem- I, f- I was apprehensive. I was apprehensive going to India, you know, because the, the, week, bef- the week I was leaving, there's, um, there was a video on CNN where three Nigerian students had been attacked in a shopping mall in India and were hospitalized. And I was like, are you kidding me? They want to send me there. But you know what? It's been the best experience ever. Okay. I've been to India about five times wow. because of work. You know, I've had yeah. no problems. Which parts? Uh, um, New De- well, Delhi. Delhi, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Okay. yeah. And then I yeah. went to the Taj Mahal and, wow. you know. And I've had some, like, I've had amazing experiences where I even went to um, a place. Uh, it was called Zorbed the Buddha. And when they, when they asked me to, to go, it was people that I, I knew through the School of Social, Social Entrepreneurs. He invited me. And when he said, oh, we're meeting at Zorba the Buddha, I thought it was a restaurant. So I'm in a taxi trying to find, this, we're, we're looking for Zorba the Buddha. We get there. There's no, um, it's night and there's no, there's no numbers on the door. So the taxi driver was like, let me just check for you. So he checks and he's the, the security's like, yeah, it's, you're in the right place. So then I told, so he went and called my guy. He invited me. And I kid you not, once I went through the, like, the entrance, there was, like, a break between the entrance and another entrance, like, takes you into the area. So when I walked through that, I kid you not, it was, like, utopia. Like, there was, the grass was so green. They had a lake with, like, lotus flowers opened, peacocks, cats. Like, it, it, was, it was, like, a retreat. Beautiful. You know, and, you know, to do yoga at, like, 5 a.m. in the morning. And I was like, wow. I left that place. I remember coming back to my hotel, calling my mom, and I was like, I feel that there's more for me to do. Was it spiritual? It was. Yeah. It was just amazing. I went there twice, actually, because the school, have you heard of the School of Social Entrepreneurs? Yeah, I've heard. Yeah. yeah. So they have a a base in India. So I wanted to see, you know, because I was gone, I was like, you know what? Let me see if I can visit them because they had their course there. So when I went, I was just like, this is magical. This is magical. Like, wow. it puts a lot of things into, into perspective. And, yeah. I, and that's why, you know, with your travel, it, travel is, is a form of education. Most definitely. You know, it's yeah. not about going to Ibiza or Mallorca or Magaluf and just partying. Yeah. I love, when I travel, is meet people. Meet I'll people. I'll talk to the taxi driver. I'll talk to the receptionist. Like, I want to talk to people. Yeah. Get deep down. So, yeah, so when I w- got sent to um, Bangladesh, I was coming through the airport and the se- um, immigration, the security guy um, said to me, that's not your queue. And it was my queue. He's like, no, you go to the other queue. And I was like, no, that's my queue. And he was like, no, 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 that queue. So I was like, what do you mean? And he was like, Indian? And I was like, no, I'm not Indian. I'm British. He was like, you're not Indian. Well, I was surprised. I was surprised because I was like, why would you think I'm Indian? Not even African, you know, Indian. So I said to our, um, later on, I said to our Bangladeshi journalist, I said, can you believe immigration thought I was Indian? And he went, yeah. And I was like, oh, wow. You know, so th- it's funny because people in other countries understand the history. Yeah, yeah. You know? That's right, that. Yeah. You understand the history, whereas I don't think in the UK, we 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 really don't know our history. This is true. That you know, true, we this. really don't. It is. So, and even with communities, the Indians, the, the Asians that are here, who've been here for as many years, they don't know the history. That's right. You know? Yeah. So. I spoke about this last time. Funny enough, I said, when, like, people say, we don't know our history, people put it on as like it's a crime. Many people don't know the history. Yeah. And what you've just said, that definitely confirms it anyway. Yeah. yeah. I was so, honestly, James, I was like, because I, I, I thought, I was saying to them, can you believe they thought I'm Indian? And they were like, yeah. Because there's parts of India, South India, and the Sri Lanka. I remember going to see the Veda people in Sri Lanka. They clearly look like black people. Mm. Because the first people that went there, and they've kept to themselves maybe in the last thousand years or whatever. Yeah. But um, yeah, yeah. But Even like um, the cities. Yeah, the CDs. CDs, you yeah. know, they, yeah. they're African, and these are things that I think that's right. a lot of us don't even know. Definitely, you know, and yeah. I think there's a city community in in Manchester, you know, but I was surprised. Uh, I thought, why would 
why would you think, you know, but also our um, journalists in Bangladesh even said to me, what you see, the, the, the Bangladeshi community that you see in the UK, the majority, majority of them come from one part of Bangladesh. And I thought, actually, that makes sense because yeah. even with Nigerians, most people will know Igbo, Yoruba, Hausa, yeah. but mainly Yoruba and Igbo. Now, Ijo, that's my tribe. It's not. It's a small tribe. Yeah, yeah. yeah and yeah. people don't even know. You know, there's, there's yeah. so many tribes in Nigeria. Like, I'm Teve. So, Teve, we are close to Hausa. You know, so most Teve people will speak Teve and Hausa. Yeah. You know, so, but if you said to someone, and no, other Nigerians will not know my tribe. Mm. You know, so there's a lot of education that needs to be unpacked um, in different in different parts of the world. You were saying before about a Bantu connection with your, your family, isn't yeah, it? Because yeah. I was looking at, I mean, I do a lot of research on the Bantu yeah. all over Africa, yeah. and it's amazing. But you could explain uh, the connection, please? Yeah, so t- um, so from what my granddad told me, t- people were originally from South Africa. South Africa, yeah. wow. So we were part of the mi- Bantu migration going up. Okay. So we followed... The, is it the river Niger? So we followed the river. Yeah. And went through Congo. Congo. Um, and then is it Rwanda? Is so it we came. So we kind of came kind of and then round. Kind, a, of, kind of a back migration. <laughs> I didn't even know. I'm trying to think of the the, the map. I, I mean, I can, I can see that. Because we can Yeah. I'm trying. So we, no, no. So we followed the path and yeah. then got into River Benue. Benue. Yeah. yeah. I'm trying to see how, we, yeah. Got into River ben, Benue. So, we, we're from Benue State, which is the most fertile land wow. in Nigeria. So it makes sense because we followed the, the river. I think I was looking at something about that river. Um, you know like the way they say the oldest people come from Ethiopia? Yeah, yeah. I see a lot of Nigerians and some historians say that with that fertile land you've yeah. just said was the area where human humanity would be easier to develop. Well, you know, I didn't want to say. <laughs> you know, I mean, this. Well, look, they said Ethiopia was, was modern, man. Then they moved it to Morocco. Yeah. They said Morocco, three hundred thousand years, the oldest modern people. So maybe it will go in Nigeria next. Yeah. And it's sad, you know. It's sad because Africa is such a beautiful place. Amazing place. Amazing. Amazing. You know, I've I've worked and trained journalists from Rwanda, Ethiopia, wow. Somaliland, um, Mauritius. Yeah. Senegal, Kenya. Wow. Like I've I've trained so many journalists. Um and I, I'm always intrigued by their history. Mauritius is a lovely place. Yeah. Isn't it? I'm always intrigued. Mm, you know. And honestly, there's so much there's a lot of um a lot of work is being done by colonialism to stop you from fully understanding their history and knowing yeah. their greatness. And suppressed, a lot suppressed. of stuff suppressed. Yeah. So where we're from, oral history was a big thing for us. It was it's very big. More reliable as yeah, well. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And, you know, a lot of things that I learned about the UK came from my grandparents. So my nan, when when they left the UK, my nan didn't said she never wants to come back here. Wow. Because she didn't like how the British, well, white British people were, you know, not in terms of racism, but attitudes. <coughs> you know, she just didn't like it. She didn't like the energy. In the UK. Energy's big. Yeah, she didn't like it. Yeah. So she always said to me, Mom, she never wanted us to move here. And she never wanted to come here. You know, so there was a lot of things that she experienced and she saw that she was like, no. And then a lot of the things that my granddad, a lot of um, instructions and advice that my granddad gave my mom, she stuck with that. And I think that's the reason why, you know, I am who I am. And... I've reached uh, the heights I've reached. You know, I'm still climbing. You know, I've, there's so much more to do. Yeah. But I think, you know, with everything, when you know your history and you are confident in your history, like anything is possible. This and is that's why I say yeah. to people, anything is possible. You know, I've got, I always say I'm not, I'm not in competition with anyone. Yeah. Like my journey is my journey. That's right. You know, and I, I have this, I've got, um, I've got two quotes that I absolutely love. Um, so one is Confucius. And it says, it doesn't matter how slow you go as long as you don't stop. Right. And then the other one is Machiavelli. And he says, those who, those who desire success must change, their con- must change their conduct with the times. You know, and I take yeah. that with everything. I so guess, yeah. um, even if you're reading the Bible, the Quran, or anything like that, you've got to interpret it in modern day times. Yeah. You've got to look at the surroundings. Because that you're, you're in. weighing around. Exactly. Yeah, that you know, makes totally sense. So Machiavelli was a clever guy. Yeah. You know, 
some people might not have liked them, but when you read about him, you fully think, all right, then the guy was strategic. He was he he, he was he was like he was a sociology sociologist before and a the, theorist, you know. But some people might have taken his messages the wrong way. But um, let me go back to the Bantu migration. Yeah, let's t- we can the importance of African history. I also got to say them words. So continue. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, the Bantu <laughs> migration. So we. So me. This is more my mum's side, the family. So South Africa coming up. We then trace my dad's family, and they were supposed to have come from Egypt and down. So a lot of Nigerians, when they see me, they go, "You're not Nigerian." No one ever says I'm Nigerian because I don't have the look that they think all oh, Nigerians. Can I ask you a question about the Egypt migration? Is this dealing with something like that could be in the last couple of thousand years possibly as well? Or is this more in the last couple of hundred years? No, no, no. This is thousands of years. Well, funny you say that because my tribe, Egypt, they've got a story about coming from Kemet, which is Egypt in modern day. I have a speak with uh, some of... some of our boys, Nigerians, and they say there's a story of the Ebos yeah. coming from as Hebrew Israelites in ancient yeah. times. So there's many stories, and Africans have always moved around Africa. Yeah. We've not stayed still, and this is what I kept on saying. You know, we, we've moved, we've mixed, we've shared ideas. M- maybe people in the Congo went to Egypt. Yeah. And anyway, you know, continue. And, I, and you know what? I th- And that's what, when you look so deep into history, that I think that's what makes me so sad, because... A lot of countries, African countries, are going backwards, yeah, because of Western influence. Instead of actually saying, you know what, a- you know, Africa is for it's for all of us. That's it. It's so rich. Yeah, it's that rich that it can never run out of resources. Impossible. It's impossible to be, you know. Yeah. But colonialism has made us think that only a certain few can benefit. Yeah. There's a limitation to our abundance. That's right. Do you That's know what I mean? Right. Yeah, yeah. So when I, it's funny because when I meditate, it talks about stop looking at the physical abundance, look at the spiritual abundance. Mm. If you think, if you think of everything from a spiritual abundance, you will know that there's enough for everyone. Definitely. So then that should hopefully stop you from being so greedy. Yeah, yeah. But not everyone wants to go that deep because when you go that deep, then that means you've got to really think hard about yourself and your actions and how. How your actions can influence, how your actions can actually destroy people. That's right. And a lot yeah. of people don't want to think about that. It's all about, oh, I'm doing it for my family. I'm doing yeah. it for fi- Okay. You know? Yeah, yeah. You know, and that's why Africa now is just part of Africa. I'm not going to say the whole, but part of Africa are slowly being eroded by greed and yeah. Western influence. Well, it's good that you're the free spirit. <laughs> but that's what's, uh, this is the conversation I always have. I don't like put myself in a structure yeah. to say I've got to, I don't have a set of rules, but I have my models. Yeah. And basically, if someone says, well, what do you believe? Do I believe? I believe in the creator. Yeah. You know, I believe in spirituality. I'm, I'm not religious, but, you know, people are religious and they practice spiritually. Yeah. I can connect with people because yeah. it's, that's what it's about, having a connection. Yeah. It's like when I visit a tribe, my mindset, because you're first meeting these people, you've never met me before, you might see my pictures, videos, but, when you see them face to face, in order for me to get close, I've got to connect spiritually. Yeah. You know, it's an energy. It. It's an energy. It's an energy. I say this all the time. Yeah. And, you know, through the pandemic, I've always said that I needed to, I needed to protect my energy because for a long time, I gave so many people access to me. Yeah, yeah. Even people that I thought shouldn't have access okay. because I've always been open. But during the pandemic, I've gone, no. For me to be able to move the way I want to move, I've got to protect my energy, you know, because some people are just soul destroyers. You know, they're soul eaters. You have them around and then you wonder why certain things aren't going your way. And, you know, within our community, we sometimes have this toxic loyalty. Yeah. Do you get me? Yeah, definitely. And I think anyone who's listening... If you've got that toxic loyalty, you need to let it drop. Let it drop, Because yeah. that yeah. is blocking you from your next step. That's right. You know, is. and yeah. when, I've, when I've let go of people, like when I say I get rewarded by the universe, I get rewarded. Yeah. You know, That's because right. the universe doesn't want this person to be part of my next chapter. That's right. You know, and I think That's totally right. people need to understand that. You know, when I first started my spiritual journey, I, w- I, never, I didn't really talk about it. 
you know, I would read books and some some of it I was like, oh my God, I'm so excited because it related to how I felt, you know. But then as time went along, I was like, well, you know, there's certain things that when, you've, when you're on that journey, there's certain energy and words that people will use and go, all right, then that's a spiritual brother. That's yeah. a spiritual sister. Yeah, yeah. That's a spiritual mother. Yeah. You know. And you can pick it up quite quick. Yeah. That's one thing with energy, like we were going back. It could take so long to get to know someone. Yeah. But if it's connecting spiritually, snap of the finger. Do you know what I mean? Right in a second. Like, you, yeah. and you just don't know why. You're like, yeah. it's crazy. So, yes, I, I feel like, but again, that goes back to, you know, when we connect as, we connect back to our spirituality as African people. That's right, yeah. Because we didn't have religion. That's it, we didn't have it. You know, you know? and I remember um, this psychic actually bumped into us. Me and the girls were on the train. We were only like 16. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, and he was, he actually, um, we thought he was drunk. We were like, why is he staying at us for? You know, we were on the train from Leeds going back to Liverpool. And he just kept on staring. And eventually, we went and sat next to him. Because he was like, like, come here. No, I can't even remember whether he come towards or we went to him. And he said, he said to the girls, apologies, but I need to talk to her, pointing at me. Wow. And he said, um, he said, you've got 12 guardian angels. And I was like, 12? Wow. <laughs> I, <love that. laughs> I was like, yeah. I must be messed up if I need 12. Wow. Yeah. And he said, no, no. He said, for some reason, he said, you've got people that you know who have passed, but then you've got people, angels who are just guiding you. And he said that, from that moment, he said, listen to the voices, listen to your gut instincts, because that's them. He said, whatever anyone else says, listen to them, because they're guiding you in the right way. And I was like, okay. But in the back of my head, I'm 16. And I'm like, I believe most of it, but I'm still doubtful because I'm this young girl, you know. And then he, um, another thing he said was, um, he said, your people are spiritual people. He said, I can see... Um, I can see a mountain, I can see this big rock, and they're walking around it. He said, and they're looking to the moon and the stars and Mother Nature. He said, that's where you need to connect. And I, yeah. I you know, he said, that's where you need to connect. He said, yeah. not religion. He said, that's where you need to connect. Yeah. He said so many things, but it touched me because I was like, oh, wow. Wow. And then he even said, and then at the time as well, I didn't have a good relationship with my dad. And he said to me, he said, you need to start talking to your dad. He said, don't talk to him as your dad. Talk to him as a friend. And I was like, okay. Because when, you know, with mm. relatives and yeah. parents, we have such high expectations of what we expect them to do. That's right, yeah. You yeah, know? Yeah. And he said to me, don't, he said, look at him as a friend. And that, the next day I called me dad and spoke to him for years. Called him the next day. And we had an amazing relationship until he passed away when I was 21. But if it wasn't for this guy, I probably wouldn't have spoke to him. Right, okay. Do you know what I mean? Yes. So ever since then, I would say I've been guided in terms of my journey and yeah. what I do. Yeah. And, you know, going back to when I went to Nigeria, I remember um, the day that we were about to, you know, they were coming to, to kill us. Um, my dad came to me in a dream and he told me, he showed me, and I woke up at 6 a.m. and I said to my mum, we can't stay in this house today. And she went, why? I said, my dad said something, they're going to come and get us today. And he did. So I really, when I say, you know, when you talk about connection mm. and energy, you've really got to feel it. And some people are either scared of it or it's blocked and you have to find a way to also, connect. Also, it's also um, the word deaf. Yeah. I don't believe the is deaf, mm. only in the physical. Yeah. Energy can never be destroyed, only change its forms. So if I, I all believe in communication with the ancestors and yeah. at particular times, particular days, whenever it is, you know that you're being visited. Oh my, for sure. You know, and you get warnings. Yeah. You know, now this gets frowned upon by, you know, when people talk about ancient African spirituality. Yeah. And it's our, it's just our understanding, our observation, yeah. consciousness. Yeah. You know, so anyway, but continue anyway. Yeah. I think, I'm liking you know, this conversation. <laughs> Excellent. It's, you know what it is? I think a lot of people, because you don't have conversations with me on this level, yeah. sometimes might be surprised. Yeah. You know, um, but I share that information with people that I feel are connected. Yeah, I don't totally agree with do you. Do you know what I mean? I don't just talk to people about these things. You can't things. just go to anyone, no. yeah. Well, I've tried that, and then it, it bounces back to you. So I do. Do I look silly, <laughs> you know? Yeah, so I, I'm yeah. only connected to people who are connected 
with me in that Connection, sense. Connection, definitely. You know, so I don't really talk about it that open. So I, I, I always say I'm an open person, but your energy's got to be open with me for me yeah, to share that that's information. Right. So definitely. this is easy. Easiest part. Do you yeah, know what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah. So this is easy because I get it. you get it. Yeah, no awkwardness. It isn't. You that's get it. it. Yeah. You know, and and literally my whole career is just being guided, you know, and even like when, so when I left the BBC, well, when part-time, when was it? In 2012, you know, single mum, little boy. Yeah. And I was like, I'm going to, I was, this is God's honest truth. I'm sitting at my t- I'm sitting at my desk. I'm in Media City, and I'm working um, for a department called BBC BBC Outreach. And I'm sitting there, working away, and um, I just thought, I don't want this to be me forever. It just came into my head. Mm. I don't want to be in a place where there's a corporation, an organisation, or anyone controlling my legacy, controlling my finances. Just control them what I can and can't do. Yeah. You know, and obviously, you know, when you do journalism, you want to work at the BBC because that's where, that's the height that's of your career. Height of do it, you know yeah, what I mean? Yeah. So I was grateful for that. But it got to a point where I was like, I'd seen so many job courts and how that affected people, especially women and okay. especially black people that work in the industry. Mm. And I was like, I don't want to be that. I'm a single mom. I need to, I need the backup plan and I need to take control of my career and my my destiny my take, destiny definitely take do you know what I mean take yeah. control so I sat there and I'm typing away and this voice in my head said go back to university okay listen am I even kidding yet wow. it was as clear as day it said go back to university and I went and do what <laughs> and it said PGCA and I went PGCA <laughs> like literally I'm having this conversation I'm like PGCA and he goes yeah PGCA and then at the same time, I was thinking about, all right, then, because I wanted to start my own business. And I had this conversation with my mum, but I was trying to still figure out how it would look and how, you know, but I knew it was going to be with women and, you know, a social enterprise and all these things. And I said, go back and do PGCE. And I was like, where? And I said, Edge Hill University. Right? Okay, yeah. So I Googled <laughs> something, Googling, and, and Edge Hill University had this PGCA course, and it was called, um, oh, God, is it, it's oh, coming to full title now, compulsory education. Oh, God, but it's now called yeah, adult yeah. education. Yeah. You know, it, was, it, it had a, a fancy title mm. back then. And I was like, oh, oh, okay then. So I started the application then, that day, started the application, at, you know, looked at what I need to do, the references, all of that, and um, applied. And I got knocked back because I had a third class degree. They only accepted second or first. Okay. So I'm like, <sighs> but then this voice is like, listen, email the admissions officer. So I was like, okay then. <laughs> so I emailed and said, I know I've got a third class degree, but this is what I've achieved with my third class degree. And the guy was like, all right, then, come for the interview. I was like, this is my chance. Went for the interview, got a place in the course. Amazing. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. So, obviously, I'm not saying you always have to push, push, but you've got to listen. You've got to listen, Sometimes yeah. those, sometimes the, the refusal can also be a blessing. But in my case, the voice said, no, you've got to push through. You know, yeah. and even when I applied for the BBC, I'd applied four times to, to work there, got knocked back. And then I went through work experience because I met the right people who the advised right people, me. Yeah. So when I got um, work experience, I was so excited. And there was a few people who were like, yeah, but it's just work experience. And I went, no, it's not, because that's all I need. People yeah. didn't realize that's all I needed wow. was just to get in, because I knew once I got in, I wasn't going to leave, unless on my terms. Yeah. So when I got it, like, what? It's 16 years. I've not left. Amazing, though. Through work experience. Through work experience. You know. You know, I've really enjoyed this conversation today and we're forcing, you know, we come to the end of the show. We have to get you back on again sometime. <laughs> you spoke about spirituality, history, your timeline, being a journalist, you know, even going into your family, what happened in Nigeria, you know. I, I, this is an amazing conversation. I want to thank you very much, Gunan. My pleasure. You know, um... So we're going to end this out right now. This is James DeBow on Discovering Season 3. And I want to thank Gunan again. Thank uh, you. <laughs>